say. He understood it in his mind, in his head, but never actually received it in his heart. So uh, he trusted the Lord got saved. Amen. Now the ironic part about that <laughs> is a pet peeve of mine is these camp meetings where people go forward and get saved, and every year they get saved again, and every year, and you're just like, what's going on? So here's what's ironic. First night of camp, a, pre- a, a preacher's kid got saved, and and they, they had gotten saved before. I'm quite certain, like maybe every 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 year they come forward and get saved. And there might be more to the story that I'm not knowing, but anyway. And it was in my mind, and so that night we try to lead in a devotion, you know, before they go to bed, and and I. I, Zachary's the only guy that we had, so it was just him. I said, you know what, I want to talk about this. And I was coming at it with a little bit of a critical, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm still critical of it. <laughs> I am, because I think there's a, it's a big danger sometimes in the way that things are preached and the altar call. There's a lot of emotion, a lot of trying to get people to come. And and, uh, and so then they start second-guessing their salvation and everything. So I am critical about that, but I came with that idea, and I was I was talking to Brady, and I said, why do you think that happens? What, what causes these people who got saved to think that they're not saved and think that they have to be saved again? And this is my recollection of the conversation. If he was up here giving a testimony himself, maybe he'd say it a little differently. But basically, he began to tell me, well, I think I understand how it happens because you grow up, and you're in a Christian family, and you know that you're supposed to believe it. And he says, you don't remember getting saved. He's, he didn't remember a time he ever called on the Lord or, or put his faith in it. He just, he just kind of knew. And he, he kind of said, every time we go soul winning and you're knocking on doors and you see somebody get saved or, or you hear even about it, you might talk to a Catholic or something and they say, oh, yeah, I love the Lord and I do this and I do that. And they're talking about this relationship they have with the Lord. And you're like, well, you don't even believe the gospel. How could you be saved, right? And he's like, oftentimes when he hears that kind of things, he's convicted in his heart because he's like, but I, I know I'm saved. Look, I, I know what I'm supposed to say. I know what I'm supposed to believe. So look, every individual, we say this all the time, we can't see the heart. And uh, we know based on the words of the Apostle Paul that some people can believe in vain. They can say that they believe and they don't truly believe. But um, I think it took a lot of humility, especially considering the context and everything, for him to say, yeah, I don't believe that I'm saved and I want to make it. I want to get that, make that official now, and put my my trust in Jesus Christ, and and so uh, that's exciting. We'll talk to him about baptism and and, uh, and and all that kind of stuff. But glad to share that. Just didn't know exactly how to share it, and we put it off. There are other people we wanted to tell, and how do you tell everybody at the same time? And we can't right now. So uh, anyway, that's not the message. Nothing to do with the message. Uh, tonight, this afternoon. And sheepdogs. Sheepdog. You know what a sheepdog is? I guess there's lots of different types of sheepdogs, but uh, but they got a job, a very important job in the uh, the job of, of of raising sheep. They've got an important uh, job that they're supposed to do. So to look at Ezekiel 23 to, to start with. There's a lot of there are a lot of verses in the Bible that warn us about wolves and and talk about that subject. So Ezekiel 23, we'll start in verse 23. Ezekiel 23, 23. Let me see here. Make sure before I start reading this. Chapter 22, verse 23. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, talking about Israel, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls and have taken the treasury, the treasure and precious things. They have uh, made thereof many widows, in the midst thereof, her priests have violated my law, 
and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, uh, and I have profaned among I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls and to get dishonest gain. So the prophets of old were prophesying about wolves and the princes there of the of this people and talking about false prophets and talking about all this and saying beware of wolves. Matthew 7 15 Jesus says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And then Matthew 10, and I'll read this more of this chapter here in a minute, but I'll read to you this one verse. It says, Behold, Jesus says to his disciples, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And then Acts chapter 20, which we just read, look at verse 25. Acts chapter 20, verse 25. So in this, uh, in this story here, uh, Paul, you know, I love this story. I was talking to Brother Austin about this a while back. I feel like in this story we see that Paul the Apostle was an ultra marathoner <laughs> because he decides to go on foot, you know, from uh, Miletus to Ephesus, or I'm uh, sorry, from Assos to Miletus, and, uh, and, if, and, and everyone else was in a ship, but he decided to go on foot, and if you count that up, uh, I did it once, and I came up with 31. Well, we're just going with that. That's a 50K. That's an official mar ultra marathon. So <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> but that's not what this message is about. The question I've always had is why did he choose to go on, on foot, and why did he go on such a long hike? And I feel like in the context, I can tell why. He had a whole lot he wanted to say to these elders from Ephesus, and it might be the last time he saw them, and he was going to Jerusalem. So he wanted to give them some last words, and I feel like he spent that time going through some of his thoughts and what he's going to say, probably praying, and that's just kind of my idea about that. That's not what the Bible says necessarily, but here's what it says in verse uh, 25. Now he's talking to his uh, to the elders, and he's admonishing them, and he's saying that he's going away, and uh, it says, And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw any away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And he goes on a little bit about that. So he's talking to the elders and he says, I want you to beware. I want you to know grievous wolves are going to come in among you. Right? So, I mean, I don't want, uh, we don't want to be paranoid, right? We want to watch and be cautious, but and I'm not talking about being paranoid, but like every time a new person comes in, there is that in the back of your head that says, well, let's just watch and make sure they're not going to be preaching any false heresy or, or, or trying to draw people away or, or doing anything like that. Let's keep it in the back of our minds, right? And particularly to the, uh, to the elders, you know, and those who, who have the rule and the oversight of the church, but let's be cautious of that. But then he says, not only that, but there will be some among you Right, that will rise up and you'll be like, oh, I never knew that was a wolf. You know, he's dressed in sheep clothing, or, or you, you know, you could look at it like, uh, like the Judases. You know, nobody knew if they were among them, and then all of a sudden they, they surface. And so he says, look, this is going to happen. And that's not the only place, obviously, in the Bible where we have those kind of admonitions. I mean, you get towards the end, First Peter, you got Jude, you got all these warnings about those who are going to creep in unawares and those who are going to. Uh, draw many away and all that very common uh, to see about that see that in the scripture so when it comes to the idea of wolves being in the church there are three things we need to deal we're going to look at in this sermon that deals with uh 
three things that we need when dealing with wolves. Okay, number one, this is pretty, this is pretty simple and basic, but think about this. Number one, we need the gathering of sheep, right? We need the gathering of sheep. What if we only had like a handful of, of elders, right? And no sheep, but just all these elders and like, are you, are you a wolf? No, are you a wolf? Are you a wolf? You know what I mean? So it, sometimes it can be that way where you get this church and like everyone thinks it's their job to be the shepherd. You know what I mean? And I'm not, thank the Lord, I don't feel like that's this, this church at all, but there are these churches where everybody feels like they have to be the shepherd and everybody's just pointing fingers and calling out this person as a false prophet and, and wickedness. And, uh, and, and look, we really just kind of need churches to have just sheep. Now, being called a sheep is not necessarily a compliment. I understand that. Right. Even in our society, when it comes to politics, if you listen to talk radio and you listen to this different guy, what do they say? A bunch of sheeple out there, right? You got these sheep that just follow blindly whatever the government says or whatever. And that's true, right? Sheep are not known for being just these brilliant animals. Uh, you know, I saw this sheep, uh, this, this YouTube video. I, I'm pretty sure it was a sheep. But there's a sheep and he falls into some kind of hole or something and and so all these guys come, and for some reason everybody wants to record this on YouTube and share it because there's a, that you show everybody their great deeds of rescuing these animals. But, uh, but then they get this, uh, I don't know if it's caught up in a barbed wire fence or a hole, I can't remember that idea, maybe you've seen it before. And it takes him like five, ten minutes to get this thing out of there, and then they finally release him, and guess what he does? Runs right back into the same hole. <laughs> right? And that's kind of how sheep are, right? Sheep just kind of go... Uh, they don't really inspect everything before they eat it, and so, you know, who knows what kind of trouble they're going to get into. They're easily led uh, off course, and they can fall for uh, the prey, to be prey of wolves. And obviously, I wouldn't want anybody in our church to just be blind follower of man and, uh, and get themselves into dangerous situations. But the idea is that churches need to have sheep. They need to have a group of people that need to be led. And if you feel like, you know what, I've got a pretty good grasp on the Bible, I've got a pretty good understanding, and I know how to spot a wolf and all that, well then, you know what you can do is go, in, go out and find some sheep and bring them into church, because we need sheep. We need people that need to be discipled, people that need to grow, people that need to be protected. And, uh, and so at some point, we can't spend all of our time just thinking, oh, that's a wolf, that's a wolf, that's a wolf, but we need to bring sheep into the church. And I'm not talking about just filling up a church just for the sake of you know, having bodies and having high numbers. But we need people who are willing to be taught and to learn, learn the Bible. Now, there are a lot of wolves out there who are starting churches, and they have lots of sheep. But unfortunately, they're wolves. And so they're, they're gathering up all the sheep, and they're just going to devour them, right, for filthy lucre or, the, or whatever their motivation is. And there are a lot of people, you know, I think about... Most of the mega churches, I can't say all of them for sure, but most of the mega churches, you just find out that the person that is leading that congregation is just a wolf. And probably lots of wolves that are like, you know, in, in, in on it. And so, uh, and so obviously there are a lot of uh, bad preachers out there, people, uh, wolves, starting churches and all that. But, uh, but I feel like this, I feel like, if, if, if God, and I'm, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but if God is actually the one that's in charge of the sheep, right, and a person is truly saved, but just doesn't know, like, right, if any of you lack wisdom, ask, you know, ask the Lord, and, uh, and, and there are people out there that don't know, right, there are, there are eunuchs out there, you know, Ethiopian eunuchs out there who have the Bible and say, hey, I don't know, unless some man guides me. Right? There are people out there that are like, hey, sirs, what must I do to be safe? They're out there. They're out there. But I feel like if their heart is really there, they're really seeking the Lord and they're true, true sheep, and I'm going to get to what that is in a minute, then the Lord is going to lead them to a place where they can be shepherded and they can be fed and they can be nourished and they can be protected and all that, don't you think? And so, you know, if we're in the ministry of saying, hey, we want to help people, we want to, you know, make sure people are getting the word of God and they're fellowshipping, and we want to have a group of people that we're worshiping God together, we're getting work done, and, uh, and, and the Lord is going to 
to grant that, I really believe if our heart is, Lord, we want to do it for you. We don't, we're not trying to raise up people for, you know, so that we can, you know, milk them for all their money, you know, or, or, or whatever. We don't want to just raise up people so that we can look good in the eyes of, of other people. We actually just want to do the ministry and have, and, and, and have people and lead them closer to, to the Lord. Then the Lord's going to send them. That that's the case but obviously we can't just have a bunch of sheep wandering around with no shepherds so we need shepherds okay now it, it's apparent in scripture there's there seems to be this uh you know we call him the pastor shepherd and actually that's what pastor means is shepherd okay but we also know this that jesus is the shepherd right he's the great shepherd he's the good shepherd look at john chapter 10 Get to the sheepdogs in a minute, okay? John chapter 10. <clears throat> Look at starting in verse 11. This is Jesus talking. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, who, whose own the sheep are not, Seeth the wolf coming, and leadeth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I'll stop there for a second, and then we'll, we'll read the next verse. Um, I, I'll struggle. Usually, when we say like that guy's a hireling, have you ever heard somebody call it a hireling? You know, everybody know what I'm talking about. A hireling. We usually what they're talking about is a pastor who's just in it for money, and they say that's a that's just a hireling. All he wants is the money. He doesn't really care about the sheep. Now, to a certain extent, I'm going to say this. I'm a hireling. <laughs> I don't. I, it's not, I'm not interested in your money. But you know what? I do get paid. This is my job, right? In a manner of speaking, I'm a hireling. In a manner of speaking, I am, uh, you know, doing this in, 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 a, in a really small manner of speaking as a job, as, as, a, as a, you know, this is, this is my duty. This is my calling, right? It would be pretty difficult. I'm not saying I wouldn't do it, but it'd be pretty difficult for me to just say, you know what? I'm going to lay my life down for this flock right here, right? Or, or Iola, you know? I'm going to lay my life down for that flock. I think I would do it. But you understand what I'm saying? That's a little, it's, a, it's a little difficult to just be like, yeah, I would just lay my life down. Right? But the idea that he's saying here isn't so much calling out the hirelings, although there are definitely wicked people out there that just want that they're just in for the money. But the point that he's making here is this. The good shepherd, he gave his life up for the sheep. The good shepherd, he, la he laid his life down. He cared about us so much. He gave us the means by which we can be saved, right? Look at verse 16 now. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man take it from me, uh, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Let's see, go to verse 25. Jesus answered and said, I told you, that, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Of course, that made him mad. They took up stones and wanted to kill him because he made himself equal to the Father. <clears throat> all right, so here's the deal. The Bible said right there, he's particularly dealing with his disciples. They're particularly going after the uh, lost you know, sheep of Israel, the lost uh, uh, tribe of Israel. And, and he's going after them. That's where, they're, that's where they're ministering to. But Jesus says, you know, i got other sheep that are not of this fold. 
And he says, one day they're all going to be one fold and they're going to have one shepherd, right? So that really lessens my position as a pastor because you know what? I'm not raising you up to be my sheep. You know, you're not my sheep. You're, you're the Lord's sheep. Every church out here that's a genuine church, that's got genuine saved people in there, they've got one shepherd, and that's the Lord, all right? And so my job would be more of what we would call like the under-shepherd. You've heard that phrase used before, like, like I'm working for the Lord, who is the true shepherd, who went away and gave his life for the sheep, actually, and now I'm just kind of bringing them to him and leading them along. Look at Psalm 23. I'll show you what I mean, what I'm talking about. Psalm 23 is a famous chapter that talks about the uh, the Lord being our shepherd. And here's what David said. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now here's an interesting thought. There's only one shepherd out there, one good shepherd, the, the shepherd. There's only one Lord, right? All the people that are saved could be called his sheep, right? So I'm not universal church, but that would be the idea that, you know, there, there are the church is made up of people all over. You know, I would say to disagree, and I've, I've talked about this before, when we get to heaven, we'll be one flock. One body, well, that's one church, right? And so, in a manner of speaking, that's the way it is now. But we lead, we want to lead people to the Lord, not to the individual, not to the, not, not to the shepherd, okay? And so he's saying right here that my sheep know my voice, and uh, and they follow me, right? And then you read Psalm 23, and you're saying, hey, he leads me beside the still water, he takes care of me. But I knock on doors all the time. I just did the other day, and. When we were out there in the Iola area knocking on doors, and the guy said, you know, I don't really go to church. I believe the guy was saved. I mean, he, he does a lot. He reads a lot of books, and he reads the Bible. And his testimony, it sounded like he was saved, but he said, I don't really go to church. He said, you know, you've heard it before. You know, I've been to church before, and just a lot of hypocrites, and there's people, you know, just bickering and fighting and all this kind of stuff. And so his excuse was, yeah, I just don't like the church, so I can just stay home and and uh you know worship the lord on my own and read my bible I mean, my, okay now in a manner of speaking if, if he's your shepherd and you stay at home he'll provide he can provide for you he can take care of you he can lead you beside the still water yeah you can get a lot out of reading the bible but the only one problem the bible says you need to go to church <laughs> you need to be with other believers you need to be, assemble yourselves together and, and and here's david who is calling him, the lord his shepherd he says and then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? Well, where is the house of the Lord now? Heaven? No. Yeah, I mean, it is, but I'm saying what he calls the house of the Lord or the temple of the Lord here on earth is the church, right? So when we meet together here, we are the body of Christ. We are the temple of God. And, uh, and we meet together as this, this church. Other churches are meeting all over the world who are, who are his sheep, and they're meeting together with one shepherd over them, or under shepherd, and, uh, and he's leading them, but they're all part of the same body, part of the same, same shepherd, but they, they want to be in church. They want to be under the preaching and the teaching of a, of a pastor. They want to be, you know, assembled together with other believers and be part of that flock, you know, and then one day, yes, we'll all be under the, the you know, under one shepherd and we'll all be one big flock. That would be amazing, all right? But we need shepherds I mean, we need to sheep, and sheep need a shepherd. And, uh, and and then the third thing, and this is what the main uh, part of my message is about, that we also need sheep dogs. Okay, sheep dogs. Now, if you look up sheep dog, I mean, that, th this is basically what it means, but you will probably won't find a whole lot of definitions. But the word livestock guardian dog, 
LG, LGD, okay? Livestock guardian dog. Let me just read exactly what was written in Wikipedia. I seem to do a lot of preaching out of Wikipedia. <laughs> Here's what it says. A livestock guardian dog, LGD, is a dog type bred for the purpose of protecting livestock from predators. Livestock guardian dogs stay with the group of animals they protect as a full-time member of the flock of herd, a flock or herd. Their ability to guard their herd is mainly instinctive as the dog is bound to the herd from an early age. Unlike herding dogs, uh, unlike herding dogs which control the movement of the livestock, LGDs blend in with them, watching for intruders within the flock. The mere presence of a guardian dog is usually enough to ward off some predators. And LGD, LGDs, that sounds almost like a cult. <laughs> LGDs confront predators by vocal intimidation, barking, and displaying very aggressive behavior. The dog may attack or fight with a predator if it cannot drive it away. Now, I don't know if you see the symbolism <laughs> okay, or not, but here, here's, here's what I'm seeing in my head. What is a guard, what is a, what is a sheep dog? I'm just going to say sheep dog, okay? The other one sounds weird. What is a sheep dog, all right? A sheep dog has a, has a loyalty to that herd, right? Probably started from its inception, started from the very beginning. Since it was a child, it, it, it was raised up in in that. Okay, so I'm looking around. A good majority of the people in this room, right, started when Iowa Baptist Temple KC Mission started. You were here. You began. You've got an attachment. You've got a loyalty to this to this herd, if you will, this flock. Okay, and so you have a desire to make to to see, just kind of similar to a shepherd, right? You're kind of working alongside the shepherd, right? And you're you have a, a desire to make sure that people don't infiltrate, people don't come in and, and teach heresy, people don't come in and devour up the flock, people don't come in and cause division and all that kind of stuff. You have a vested interest and this is your flock too. And so you don't wanna see that happen. And so what happens is if somebody comes in who is of that type, they can spot you out. And they're like, this person's not gonna let this fly. So they're gonna to try to find some of the weak members of the church, right? And those are the ones that they're going to try to uh, uh, get with, get along with and try to talk about their uh, false doctrines with or whatever, you know, and I haven't seen that, but you know it happens in every church, so we have to know, like it said, watch and be ready, it's going to happen. And they're teaching them some false doctrine, or they're p putting them against each other and saying, hey, you need to watch this guy over here, and then next thing you know, there's divisions and all this kind of stuff. You know, they're going to go after the weaker ones. But if they see the sheepdog... That's a, that might be enough just to make them leave and, and say, you know what, it's kind of protected. I don't see where I can get any of these weak ones, and so I'll just go find another flock to destroy, right? But at the time that they do start showing their head, you know, uh, that, that, they're, that they're a wolf, you know what that, that sheepdog's going to do? Start barking, <laughs> start raising his voice, and start, start like, you know, getting mad, showing his teeth a little bit. Now... I find this interesting because I preach a lot about hey, we need to show mercy, we need to show grace, you know, we need to love people, give people the benefit of the doubt sometimes, and, and all that. And you might be tempted to think, okay, well, we all just need to chill out and just not speak up and not, you know, get too worried about that, let pastor take care of it, whatever. whatever. But, you know, actually... I would rather have people who are showing their teeth a little bit too often and being a little bit loud too often, and I have to say, no, 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 let's calm down, let's not do that, right? Than to have nobody doing that. Does that make sense to you? Okay, now, you're, if you're thinking in terms of just this congregation, you might be like, I'm having a hard time seeing that. Now, think of a whole bunch of other churches that you know. Maybe some churches that you only know from their online presence or whatever, but you see, these guys have some sheep dogs, all right? Now, I don't, I don't at all, the ones that I'm thinking of, I don't at all condone that behavior or say, hey, be like this person or that person. But here's the idea. These people are zealous and they say, I love this church. I love my pastor. I love what's going on in this flock. And I don't want it to be destroyed. And so they're being, you know, 
very passionate about that. Jesus had some sheep though. <laughs> Let's look at Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Verse 17. In James, and this is uh, listing the, uh, the, the, all the disciples here. In James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, Bo I can't remember how to say it. Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. Now, he, Jesus gave these guys a specific nickname, the sons of thunder. Why do you think he would give them that, that name? I think because he knew a little bit about their personality, right? So look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 53. So Jesus is leading his, his flock, and they go... Uh, and they entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And verse 53 says, And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, what was their name? The sons of thunder, right? James and John saw this. They said, Lord, wilt thou that we, uh, that we command fire come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Now, you think they could have just called down fire from heaven? I mean, not without God's permission, <laughs> but they're asking for permission, kind of like, hey, can we just call down, you know, fire from heaven and just devour these people? But he turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village, all right? Now, what about Peter? Peter was a sheepdog. Look at John chapter 18. John 18, start with verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Who seek ye? This is when they came to get, uh, Judas had betrayed him, and they came to get him in the garden. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as they had said unto him, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, I can't help but read this way. Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine? Like, he just spoke a word and they fell backwards. They couldn't help it, right? And then they get up and they're like, well, we still got to take you with us. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's pretty, that's pretty interesting. But they did. Jesus willingly went. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest servant, priest servant, and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was, was Malchus. Now you've probably heard this before, but it seems to me like he was going for his head. And Malchus, Malchus probably just turned like that and he got his ear, right? He's going to cut this guy's head off because he's like, you're not going to take Jesus. <laughs> and he just went, no. Jesus rebukes him. Jesus heals the servant and he rebukes him and says, hey, in fact, let's read what he, what he says there. He says, uh, then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And so, you know, then they took him and bound him and they went off. Now you might tempted to be to think this. We all we all are tempted to think, yeah, that Peter, a radical, a bad guy. You know, he was too violent. He was too like eager to jump and cut someone's head off. He was just too eager to just jump in the water. And and, and, and you know, those sons of thunder, right? You remember when they were standing before Jesus and they're like, oh, Jesus, and their mom had something to do with this too. But they're like. Hey, you know what? In the kingdom, can I sit on your right hand throne and my brother sit on the left? And, and can we just be with you? And, uh, and you know, I, you have to read between the lines a little bit, but it, I like reading the, whenever Peter's talking about John and when John's talking about Peter, 
Because even in the Bible, it seems like they're at odds with each other. You know, <laughs> Peter, it seems like he's always like, you know, how about that that one that that one that you love, right? <laughs> Actually, John calls himself that, the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> and, uh, and and Peter sometimes is kind of like, well, what about him? What's going to happen to him, right? Remember whenever he asked that, and Jesus is like, hey, what does it matter to you? What happens to him? Maybe you know he won't even. Maybe he maybe he'll be alive. You know, whenever I come back, maybe he won't be alive. What's that to you, right? And, and, and even whenever they run to the, uh, to the tomb, right, to see, the, to see Jesus, the body isn't there anymore. And, uh, and John writes about that. And he's like, yeah, the one whom Jesus loved it. Yeah, I, I don't remember how he says it, but he's like, yeah, I, I outran Peter, and I got there first. <laughs> and I feel like they're at odds. Like, yeah, you know, this guy's a little more passionate than that person. And this guy's like, oh, yeah, well, I love Jesus more than you. Oh, no, I'm going to sit at his right-hand throne. And here are these guys like just just falling over themselves to, to serve the Lord, and they're gung ho, and they're like, you know, we're not going to let this happen. They're just overzealous. And you might say, like, man, these guys, you know, they is God really going to use them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on, doesn't He use the humblest among us? Well, who's to say they weren't humble? I think they were pretty humble guys. They were just uh, very zealous as well. Here's the thing that I want to point out. You realize that those three men that I just mentioned, the sheepdogs, were part of the inner three (laughs) of Jesus' circle. Jesus had 12 disciples. Of all his followers, these are the 12 that, like, behind closed doors, we're going to discuss things. These 12 are, like, the important, you know, they're going to start the church. Except Judas. Judas got in there somehow. (laughs) And, uh, and, And he starts with them. But then out of those 12, there were three. Peter, James, and John. These ones got to see the transfiguration of Christ. These ones got in on all the, the secret, secret meetings. <laughs> they got in there, and Jesus revealed his heart to them. And, uh, you know, in the garden, you know, they're right there with them, and they're going to pray with them, and, and they fell asleep. But, you know, he's, he's trying to invest in them. He's like, hey, you guys, you know, you got an important role in this thing that I'm starting, the church, Okay. And when Jesus, right before he goes, uh, he ascends up to the Father, what's he do? He says, Peter, and he, he, he says, you know, uh, he's a little play on words there, and, and he says, you know, uh, upon this rock I'll build my church. And, and so that's another story I'm not going to get into. But <laughs> really he's, what he's doing in a way is he's saying, Peter, you know, I, you're going to take my role as I go back. I'm still the shepherd. I'm still the head of the church. I'm still the the, the the one in charge, the chief, right? But you're going to build upon the cornerstone, right? And you guys are going to help keep this thing going. James, John, they became they became instrumental in the church in the early church there at uh, Jerusalem and, and what have you wrote books of the Bible and and uh, these were the inner three of Jesus's closest friends and closest like co-laborers and he passed things on to them and uh and you know there's no doubt that we can get overly passionate sometimes there's no doubt sometimes somebody has to come along and say hey man i appreciate your zeal i appreciate you looking for the flock but let's not forget we're supposed to love and we're supposed to but do you see what i'm saying if you see somebody who just loves their church loves the Bible, you know, defends it, doesn't want false teaching, doesn't want people to come in, you know, uh, that could possibly be harmful to the church or, or whatever, and they seem like overly passionate, you know what, don't think that that means that they're the bad guys <laughs> by any means. You know what they are, they're the sheepdogs, and they are the ones protecting the flock and looking out for the flock, and they've got a vested interest in the flock, and they want to make sure that the wolves are not going to come in here and devour the flock. And I think uh, we don't need to force ourselves to be those uh, sheepdog, right? But we just need to be willing to watch and be leery. We probably should just focus on being sheep and learning and growing in the word and all that. But let those people who are passionate and, and, and are maybe more willing to, to fight the fight and to uh, have those conversations, let them do it. Let them do it because uh, they're probably protecting you more than you think. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. Lord, help me as the, uh, the leader of the church, as a pastor, to be um, 
wise and to know what we need and what we don't need and, and to be able to lead uh, everybody uh, to, the, to the best potential and making sure that this work is successful for you and, 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 and prosperous and bringing forth fruit for your name. And Lord, I pray that you'll just help us to watch and be weary, uh, to be leery of a uh, of potential danger that might come in here. And Lord, I thank you for those who uh, are passionate and protective of the flock. And I pray that you'll use that for good and uh, help us, Lord, to just uh, come together and, uh, and work together as a team and also to continue to grow as we see more sheep who, are tr who truly belong to you come in here for the nourishment and the uh, protection that they need. And I pray, Lord, that you help us all to have the attitude like David did, that we would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name I pray.